The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. First of all, my name is Sam Johnson. I work with the Electric Power Research Institute. I'd like to first thank all of you all for being here. I'd like to thank Matt and Chris for giving me this opportunity to come and talk to you all about this report that we just finished. Every just published it. What I'll be talking about in the report, it is open to the public and free, and the details of that report will be at the end of this presentation and where you all can go to find this information. The title of my presentation is Concrete Inspections for Dry Cast Storage Systems. Luckily, the two previous speakers have covered a lot of the intro stuff, so I'm going to skip over that so we can get into the meat of it a little bit. Just quickly, agenda, going to go very briefly over an introduction and the license and COC renewal process, then talk briefly about concrete degradation inspection techniques, and then the majority of it, will I'll be going into the three major designs for these dry cast storage systems and going into the degradation mechanisms that can occur with each specific design and inspection techniques that can go with each design, and with a little bit of operating experience and summary at the end. Introduction, it's been covered. Fuel leaves the pool, goes into metal canisters. Metal canisters go into concrete overpacks. Concrete overpacks sit on the big pad outside and they're going to stay there for years, 40 years or so. And there you go, intro. The license and CC renewal, essentially it's already been laid out that during the renewal process they'll be going through all the different components while they need a aging management program or a TLAA, time limited aging analysis. With the aging management programs, inspections are going to be important in that. So I just wanted to kind of give the background of why these systems will need to be inspected. And then lastly, just the important safety functions for the concrete overpacks. These aren't the official ones. Ricardo had the official wording, but physical protection, radiation shielding, heat removal. These are what we need to make sure that these systems can do during their license period. So these are what we need to be inspecting for and monitoring to make sure that these dry cast storage systems can keep going with these functions. I think Almost everyone in here knows concrete degradation mechanisms, so don't really need to speak a whole lot about this. Just one thing, I do not have creep listed here. When working with my other colleagues at EPRI, we decided that we don't necessarily think creep will be a huge issue for these systems just because the sustained loading is self-weight for the most part. There's not a lot of sustained loading, so we don't think creep will be an issue. If it is, it's covered just like shrinkage cracking. Lastly, I added construction-related issues just because we have seen some of that in some operating experience. It's not necessarily a degradation mechanism, but it's something that we need to be inspecting for either on the front end when they're initially cast or down the road if we don't find them. Inspection techniques, just kind of a broad overview. These systems are designed to 349 for the most part, and so we do have 349.3R as guidance for our in-service inspection for the existing structures. In 349.3R, it gives us our four kind of areas of evaluation, which include visual, our non-destructive evaluations, invasive techniques, and analytical methods, which is modeling. But to do good modeling, we need good data that comes from other inspections. The invasive techniques, I'll be giving this presentation in a few weeks to a lot of the utility members. The licensees do not want to do invasive techniques if they don't have to. They really don't want to take a core. They really don't want to drill into it. Taking a core, we need to go through the analysis to make sure if that compromises the radiation shielding capabilities or not. So essentially, if we don't have to do invasive techniques, we don't want to. But what EPRI was looking to do with this report is to give information on all types of inspection and evaluation techniques that can be used, not necessarily saying they should be used, but just what is out there for utilities and licensees to use. We have three major designs that utilize concrete for these overpack systems and dry cast storage systems. We have the horizontal storage module. This is the new homes by Arriva Transnuclear. 
We have a vertical reinforced concrete cylinder. There are multiple NPC, UMS, and Magnastore all by NAC International. We also have the VSC24 energy solutions, but they're all essentially the same. The dimensions and you know the details will change, but for purposes of this, they're the same general idea of a reinforced concrete cylinder with a steel liner on the inside. And then the last design that I'm going to talk about today is the vertical steel encased concrete cylinder, and that's the High Storm 100 by Holtec International. And we're going to see that the concrete encased in steel will have some differences in what we can and can't do. To start off with the New Homes HSM, you can see there I have some information just general on the design. But essentially, it's a big concrete box that is normally prefabricated and then transferred onto site, as you can see to the image on the far right. The canister is then loaded, and it's horizontally, as we can see down here. The canister will sit on a steel support structure that's inside, and the steel support structure is connected to the sidewalls or, in some designs, the bottom of the HSM. There are multiple variations to the HSM especially in regards to where the air inlets and outlets are. So in this diagram here, we can see the air inlet is at the bottom and on the tops of it. But as you can see in this image here and down here, the air inlet is not in the front, it's actually on the sides. So just depending on which design you had or which one was current will depend on your access points for remote visual inspections as we saw earlier. And so there are differences. There is not a steel liner on the inside of the concrete. Rather, there are heat shields that are attached to the inside surfaces of the concrete of the overpack, but there is about a two inch gap between the concrete surface and the steel liner. So that's why we're able to actually inspect the inside surface of the concrete. And these are pretty thick walls. One thing is, as they're arrayed on the pad, is they're put right next to each other with small gaps in between. As we can see here, that's a pretty small area. And then on the sides and backs, we'll, they'll add additional wall panels for shielding purposes. That's just kind of the general design of these. This is a table that we've developed that show the degradation or defect mechanisms that are applicable to these systems and then goes through whether or not these defects can be detected visually whether or not these mechanisms are site-specific. Degradation direction just kind of gives you an idea of whether, if it's a chemical attack, we expect chlorides to be coming in from the outside and from the environment. Thermal degradation will be coming from the inside because the heat source of the fuel will be where the overpack is seeing the majority of the heat coming in. So that just kind of gives a brief overview of that. I wanted to point out that some of these techniques can be detected visually, but you'll need to do further evaluation to determine which mechanism it actually is. Trying to find the difference between shrinkage or if it is actually freeze thaw. And then my other note here is that you cannot detect reinforcement corrosion visually if the reinforcement is embedded. And that's solely because, in Epri's opinion, we don't want to wait until we see the standing. We don't want to wait until we see spalling or delamination to know that our rebar is corroding, we want to find out sooner. So that's that quick note on that one. And then you can see site-specific freeze thaw isn't an issue in Florida. It is, you know, up in the Chicago area or whatnot. Kind of a summary of some highlights with the inspection. Remote visual inspection of the interior concrete surfaces is possible due to the lack of a steel liner on the inside. So through use of a boroscope or other remote means we can enter in through the air inlets or outlets or as what was done at Calvert Cliffs take the panel off and they put a big lead shield in front of it and then stuck the camera up over it and it was kind of interesting. The arrays of the HSMs limits the accessible exterior surfaces. So like I said, as you can see here, there's a nominal gap a lot of times between the HSMs. Even if they are directly up against each other, they are separate things. So it is exposed to the atmosphere, but might make it extremely hard to see visually. Remote techniques might be needed. And same on the backside. A lot of times these arrays are butted up against each other on the backside. So not the entire exterior surface is easily accessible for our inspections. Dense rebar placement can affect certain NDE techniques. 
so that the spacing of this rebar is extremely low and that can affect impact echo and ultrasonic shear wave methods just because as the wave goes into the concrete we get reflections from the rebar and that can make it difficult to see anything that we might want to see behind the rebar. We have a flat surface on the top. It's actually slightly tilted so that rainwater can wash off, but that large flat surface could allow for ponding potentially. So that's an area that we would want to look at when we do these visual inspections, especially if we're in a freeze thaw area. When we do a remote visual inspection, the inspection of the steel support structure I think is very important. It is coded for corrosion, but we want to make sure that there's not excessive corrosion on it just because, and this is a worst case scenario or so, but if our steel support structure fails, then we have a big issue with retrievability of our canister a lot of times. So that is something that we need to look at with this design. Going on to the MPC, the UMS Max Store VC24, these are the reinforced concrete cylinders with the steel liner on the inside. We have the very general dimensions of all the different designs here. Big thing is there's the steel liner on the inside surface of the concrete, so we don't have any way of inspecting the inside surface of the concrete. We might not need to just because it's not exposed. One thing I found interesting, there are no studs attached to the liner except for the bottom of it. So there are studs down on the bottom, but Connecting the liner to the concrete, there are no studs there, so potentially we might have some debonding as these things are moved now. None of us have really talked about the way that they transport these overpacks, but they transport them extremely carefully and extremely slowly, so I don't think we'll have an issue with that, but it is possible, and it was just something that I found interesting when looking at these designs that there aren't any studs. We have embedded steel air inlets and outlets and they're normally cast on site and transferred to the pad. We can see here in this mock-up at Palo Verde of the mounting store off to the right, you can see how dense that rebar is. The hoop bars are spaced about four inches on center and the vertical bars are spaced about seven. So this is very highly reinforced and we can have rebar on the inside near the steel liner as well. This is just showing that the table for these designs, coincidentally, they are the same as the one I showed for the new homes, just because we have exposed concrete to the atmosphere and we still have the fuel inside, which can raise the temperature and irradiation. Just some highlights for the inspections of these. The design of them and the way that they're arranged on the pad, we do have access to the entire exterior surface of these for inspections, which is great. We can expect to see cracks around the embedded steel air inlets and outlets, and that's just typical of any time we have embedded steel on the concrete. We're going to see some cracks. They'll probably go at a 45-degree angle from the corners. It's not an issue. It's just something that we're probably going to see. Using remote visual techniques, we can do an inspection of the interior of the liner, but not of the concrete surface. The High Storm 100, this is the one that I really would like to talk about. This is concrete that is encased in steel. The inside steel liner is an inch thick, and then we have 27 inches of concrete, and the outside steel is an inch thick. The concrete inside is not reinforced. There's no rebar in there. The two inch thick steel plates provide the steel structural support of it. And there are stiffeners that attach the two plates that break up the overpack into quadrants, essentially. And once again, other than the stiffeners, there's nothing attaching the concrete to the steel plates. As you can see, our table here is much smaller than the other ones. And this is assuming that the concrete is sealed inside, which means that it's not exposed to the atmosphere, so no water can get in. Through my research, I was not able to determine whether or not it is perfectly sealed. It's probably not perfectly sealed, but it's also probably still very hard for water to intrude into the concrete. As of right now, there are no good methods for inspecting the concrete. The question has been raised of, do we need to inspect the concrete for these systems? And I am not going to answer that because I don't know whether or not we need to. That might be a better question for the licensees or the NRC. The concrete can debond from the steel. If that happens and it's not sealed, then water can intrude and we could maybe even start seeing some corrosion on the inside surfaces of these plates. We have done EPRI and others have done tests on using NDE techniques to see if we can go through the steel and inspect the concrete. 
as of now, we don't have a good way of doing that. We do think that ultrasonic shear wave might be able to detect if the concrete has debonded from the steel, just looking at the polarization changes between an air rebound or a concrete rebound as it goes through the steel. But we have not tested that yet. It's just theoretical. We're looking to do some further research. Operating experience, real quickly, Calvert Cliffs, remote visual inspections were able to be performed. They also did some hammer sounding on the exterior just to check out the concrete was doing. And Three Mile Island, Idaho National Laboratory, the main thing I wanted to get out of this was that cores were taken from these. So they went through the process of going through the design and making sure that it will not affect the radiation shielding properties of these. So they were able to take cores, but once again, that is something that the licensees and the utilities want to avoid at all costs if possible. Summary, I was initially asked, how do we inspect the concrete of these? And I told them, if we have access to the concrete, we inspect it just like any other concrete structure we do in the nuclear field. So as long as we can access it, we can do direct or we can do remote visual. NDE techniques, once again, if we have access to the concrete, we can perform NDE techniques. And one note is that the dense rebar replacement can cause some effects on the reliability of the results we get due to certain NDE techniques. And then for the high storm, we can inspect both steel plates on the outside and the inside, but we don't really have a way to inspect the concrete at this moment. Here's the information for the report. The title of the report is Degradation Mechanisms and Inspection Techniques for Concrete Structures and Dry Storage Systems for Spent Nuclear Fuel. This is the EPRI report number, so if you go to EPRI.com and search for this report number, you'll have access to it. And like I said, it is open to the public and it is free.